I don't see, I know, I don't see Brian on there. He is. Right okay. next to Oh, good. Okay, <laughs> hi, Brian. <laughs> I, was, I was worried about you. Oh, you do your grid view. You see everyone. Okay, here. Oh, there we go. Oh, hi. Okay. Yeah. So this is this is gonna be my first like Zoom meeting hosting. So bear with me, all right? This okay. I have not adjusted to this way of living yet. I'm used to just walking in rooms. <laughs> yeah, not used to this. Yeah, this is crazy, man. <laughs> all right, normal. So Joe, we're live, right? You are live. Not all not right. not on Facebook yet. Almost. Okay. All right. chat you can go ahead and share your screen i guess all right let's do this all right all right and you're good all right i'm gonna um turn my stuff off and i'll be working the chat joe do you see my screen yep all right Thank you, thank you everyone for joining us. I'm, I'm really excited about today's discussion. Um, it, it's, I, I get this weird opportunity to like work with two of my favorite, I guess, art forms, right? All in one place, photography and uh, music, hip hop in particular. Um, we're gonna get started officially around 12.04, um, where we're gonna kind of introduce you know, the panel and, and you know, Vicky's project. Um, so yeah, just kind of hang out for, for, for another two minutes and uh, we should be able to go from there. How's everyone's audio, video? I think we're good. <laughs> All right, cool. Cool. We got a good a good group today too. I know, I know. This is this is cool. Kurt, you might want to maximize your screen. All right. How's that? That's good. All right. Nice. It was just Delphine, how do you feel seeing this, this the anniversary just passed? I know, right? <laughs> It's so crazy. 25 years? That's crazy. <laughs> That's really crazy. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. How are the kids? And homeschooling and all that stuff going. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Life. Oh. Um. Are we, so are, we're open, right? Like we got yeah. panelists and everything. Okay. Yeah, we're open. I'm, I'm gonna get started in about another minute, just giving the room, you know, people kind of straggle in. Yeah. Yeah, this is an interesting time because um, like East Coast is fine, for Europe and other parts of the world it's fine, for the West Coast, eh. <laughs> you know, I feel like I need to send Send me plus a cup of coffee virtually. Yeah, we appreciate it, man. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I mean, everyone's just been sleeping in a little later anyway, right? Um, yeah. So no, I have. Yeah. All right. So um, let's get started. Joe, are we good? You're good. All right. Thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Um, you know, this is a really special presentation. I think we get to discuss two really, really important art forms in terms of how, you know, in terms of storytelling and culture and art. I mean, there are just so many through lines here, right? Um, today, you know, I should focus on the story. Actually, let me take a break. Let me introduce myself. So my name is Kurt Bob. I'm a photographer based in DC um, and I sit on the board of Focus on the Story. 
Focus on the Story is a nonprofit, and we are dedicated to social impact and storytelling in the photography space, in the visual artist space, right? Um, but today's conversation, we're going to be discussing hip hop and, and photography and, you know, just going to jump right in. We're joined by Vicky Tobak, who is the author of Contact High, A Visual History of Hip Hop. Um, the link should be in the chat at some point to, you know, read about the project. You know, there's a book, it's a traveling exhibition. Um, and Vicky, you can talk more about that and kind of your story. Um, but I think, you know, when, when we conceived of this idea, you know, Vicky, you came and you said, hey, what if we had some of the photographers who were a part of the project involved in the discussion as well? And I think that is very important. Um, and it, it just adds so much value because there are stories that they can tell, you know, Delphine and Brian can tell and, and Amos can tell that, you know, you just probably couldn't get in the, in the pages of the book, right? Um, you know, the book for me is, is, you know, like you said, a celebration of hip hop culture and the photographers who've helped shape hip hop and, you know, the, the wider, I guess, visual representation of music. Um, I particularly found this project just mind blowing simply because of, you know, my belief that, you know, we share this, this American culture that hip hop is a part of, but you know, I'm from Guyana and a huge part of my American experience has been through hip hop. And so to me that that gives the, the, the art form kind of this cultural presence, right? This globally, cult, this global presence in our culture. So we're going to be joined by, you know, Vicky, um, who is the author of Contact High, Brian Lee B plus Cross. Yeah, it's right? a hard one. It, 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 it's a hard one because it, it makes, like, when I saw the, the B plus sign, I was like, oh, it's just a cross. But, yeah, it's a little bit of a riddle there. Um, thank you for joining us all the way from L.A. I know it's really early. Um, and we're also going to be joined by Delphine Fawundu. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Both Delphine and Brian have work in have uh, work in Vicky's Contact High project, and you know a lot of their work would be considered, I guess, old school or kind of like foundational hip hop stuff, right? So as you thumb through the book, you know you'll see photographs of Mob Deep and a lot of the, I guess, the originators of the art form. Um, but since hip hop kind of still has this, you know gigantic presence in our culture and our everyday life and what it means to be American. Uh, Vicky, you know, you had the great idea of um, having Pedro, aka Amos, join us for this conversation because, you know, hip hop, you know, it's often described as kind of like old school, new school, right? And I think Amos, your work kind of focuses on some of the current influencers and, and um, you know, persons of importance to the genre um, you know going through your portfolio I think anyone who has even turned on the radio and heard hip-hop you photograph those people like those current stars um, so I'm gonna turn this over to Vicky actually before I do um, for the audience let me just give you guys uh, first of all thank you for joining us but so this is this is my first time hosting a Zoom meeting, so I apologize. Some of you may be experts, but for Q and A, be sure to use the Q and A button. Um, there's it should be at the bottom of, I guess, your Zoom application, and we'll be taking questions around one p.m. All right, Vicky, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks, Kurth, and thanks everyone for joining. We have some familiar faces I see in the chat um, and some you know, people who followed the project when it was um, still just an Instagram um, thing. And so thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'm Vicki Toback. Um, I'm a longtime journalist and uh, author and, of the project and curator of the exhibition. Um, Kurt, I don't know if you want to keep sharing your screen, or are you still? Is it still sharing? shared? What? Because it, I want, are you still I want, seeing my screen? 
I well, sorry, I was seeing my. There we go. Perfect. Because I want to make sure everyone's like IG handles get mentioned and everything. Yep. Um. So real quick, I mean, I'll just kind of give a quick background of, of myself because, Kurt, when you and I first met and you said, hey, I work for this photo festival and I see your book and, you know, you were like, how and why you did you come to write this, um, this book? So, um, you know, I worked in the, before I was a journalist, I worked in the music business. Um, I worked for a label called Payday Records, Empire Management. We manage Gangstar, uh, Most Def. Jay-Z for a minute, um, and that was sort of my foundation. And during that time, in the early 90s, a lot of upstart hip-hop magazines were starting up, and so I started writing for them. Um, I became a culture journalist for a magazine called Paper, um, Ego Trip, Rap Pages, then Vibe came along, um, and so a lot of independent media I was starting to write for. Even before that, like I fell in love with the music. I was an immigrant kid. I moved to Detroit um, when I was five years old. So Detroit is really foundational to me. Um, and I always saw music as very intersectional mm -hmm. with identity and, you know, economics and neighborhoods and things like that. So growing up in Detroit made me fall in love with um, you know, the culture and the music. And so I moved to New York, I started working for the label and then started writing, became a journalist. Um, I actually met uh, both Delphine and B Plus way back then when we were all babies, when we were all starting, they were taking photos for a lot of these magazines. I was, um, you know, starting to write and things like that. So we were all just really young, figuring this out. And this was also still a time, you know, kind of before hip hop was, this big mainstream thing, like none of the big, not even like Rolling Stone or Spin were really starting to write about it quite yet. Um, so it was still kind of a small community. And so a lot of us sort of met each other. Um, it was still kind of like New York, LA, um, very regional. And so a lot of the photographers that ended up in contact high, um, both in the book and in the exhibition, I had the pleasure of sort of, you know, pounding the pavement with back in those days. Um, so with that said, uh, I, after I wrote about hip hop, I started working for places like CNN, sort of mainstream news organizations, and I saw how they really treated their archives. And I saw that like, if you wanted to go back and pull, you know, some vintage photos from the Vietnam War or something, you could very easily do that. And archiving was seen as very serious and um, kind of create, you know, telling the story of that history. And so I started thinking back, like, hip hop has that, but where is it, right? There's all these photographers with archives sitting in their shoeboxes, you know, um, unscanned um, here and there. And so I started one by one reaching out to everyone and saying like, hey, we have, hip hop has this big treasure trove of images that a lot of people know, right? They're just sort of part of our like collective consciousness, if you will. Um, but what about the outtakes? What about the stories of, you know, Delphine going to Queensbridge to photograph Mob Deep or B plus, you know, going to Atlanta to photograph the Dungeon family literally in their dungeon. Um, so I wanted to use the photographer as a narrator to what was happening in the culture and sort of write this visual history of hip hop, which is the byline of the book. So before I kind of jump into my presentation and bring in uh, Delphine and Brian and Amos, I want to just quickly do a bio read so everyone knows their backgrounds. So Delphine um, is a photo-based uh, visual journal, visual artist born in Brooklyn, New York to parents from Sierra Leone in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, she's the co-author of Mothone, Women Photographers of the African Diaspora, and we'll talk about this later too, a lot more when we talk about Delphine's work. Um, she's the 2016 New York Foundation of the Arts Photography Fellow. Her most recent works investigate the spiritual, cultural, ideological, pre-colonial ways of being that was disrupted by voluntary immigration, colonialism, and distorted within the African diaspora through oppressive systems. 
Uh, Fugundu uses photography, video, sculpture, and printmaking to create new trans historical identities as she explores Afrofuturist ideas. She received her MFA from Columbia University. Her works can be found in the collections of the Brooklyn Museum, the Norton Museum of Art, and the Museum of Contemporary Art at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, Brian B. Plus Cross was born and raised in Limerick, Ireland. He attended the National College of Art and Design in Dublin, and in 1990 came to LA to study photography at the California Institute of Arts. While at CalArts, he began work on a project entitled It's Not About a Salary, Rap, Race and Resistance in Los Angeles, which was published by Verso Books in 93. It was nominated Rolling Stone Music Book of the Year. Um, his documenting of LA hip hop, uh, the LA hip hop community since the early 90s, his first album cover was for the Freestyle Fellowship. And since then, he's done an estimated 100 more for artists like Mosta, Rizza, Capadonna, Q-Tip, Easy e the list goes on and on. Uh, he was the photo editor, and I think this is how I first met him, um, of the highly influential rap pages from 93 to 97, and he's directed music videos and film projects for DJ Shadow, Damian Marley, Erica Badu, among others. Uh, B Plus also has a great book, which I recommend everyone get. It's called Ghost Notes, and it was published in 2017. Um, a lot of his you know, stories and amazing photography is in that book. So our newbie joining us uh, is Pedro Vasquez, AKA Amos, is a self-taught photographer born in New York, raised back and forth from Queens to the Dominican Republic, DR. Outside of film and photography, he heads an eponymous production company. Everything associated with Pedro is paying respect to his Dominican culture and New York roots through passion, transparency, and artist integrity. Um, and I, you know, I was just really drawn to his work. Well, first of all, we met through a photographer, Jorge Peniche, who's uh, part of Contact High, photographed Nipsey Hussle, was his road manager. And so we met pretty recently uh, at the New York exhibit. And then I found out that there was a very famous photograph of XXX Tentacion. It was actually the last photograph that X had posted on his Instagram, um, and it's the only photo on his Instagram now, of him at Rolling Loud um, in 2017, I believe, 2018. What? It was 18. It was 2018. Okay. 2018. Um, and I thought it would just be so interesting to have him join this conversation when we talk about photographers now versus photographers, um, you know, back in the day where, you know, I don't know that there are moments where photographers are getting this great access today to artists. So we can kind of talk, um, talk about that, you know, later on in the conversation. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, let's see, okay, and tell me, tell me if this works, but, um, so I'm going to share my screen, um, can everyone see this? Yes? <laughs> it's still showing you. Okay. How's this? No. No, it's still me. Hold on. Uh, um, because we want to see everyone's imagery. Let's see. Okay. All right. Yep. All right. There we go. All right. So, um, so this is. Is everyone seeing this full screen, by the way? No. No. <laughs> Just, um, there should be a button. Yeah. Just do slide, hit, uh, go to slideshow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on. There you go. Ah. Just go up, go up, go up to the top. Oh my God, everyone's, everyone's seeing me like. <laughs> <laughs> Presenter view, right? Hi, everyone. I'm a professional. 
Yeah. All right. No, not not that one. We don't want presenter view. Uh, we go to the end <laughs> show. Yeah. Uh. Upper left hand corner. Hit end show. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. That's cool. Yeah. Go then, to the show and then full screen, right? Yeah, that's what I was gonna do. Yeah. So move your, move your. So uh, between review and animations is the slideshow option. Where ah, uh, where in the in the actual thing or in in the tab area? Okay, here we go. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> Wait, go off of that, and then you see right next to the drop down it says slideshow. Yeah. Like, yeah. Click on that. On window. No. Uh, I think you're on the big panel, so you need to. Oh, yeah, okay. there you go, right there. Yeah, and then, yeah, and then, ah. and then hit slideshow. Okay. And then go to full screen, but go to slideshow. Yeah, click that. Okay, and here we go. Full screen. So, and then play from start. There we go. Okay. Ah, yeah. Right. There we go. All right. So, <laughs> all right. So, contact high was published in 2018. It has over 40 photographers in it. Um, in a time before digital, you know, for people who are joining who are, uh, you know, in, from the pre-digital days, you know, photographers shot analog. And so they had very uh, few shots to work with, depending on how much film they shot. So a lot of these you know, would end up on magazine covers, um, album covers, things like that. Um, and, you know, the, the process of these photographers working with editors or working with clients was, was pretty different from the way it is now. Um, the project got turned into an exhibition um, in Los Angeles, which you're seeing here, um, which opened um, in LA last April, almost a year. Uh, yeah, just a couple weeks ago to the year. Um, had a great turnout at the Annenberg Space for Photography. Um, before that, though, I just wanted to show in here, and Delphine, you probably remember this, and, and B plus you too, you guys were both there. Um, when the book came out, I wanted to just make sure that it really um, got to the photo community. Um, I mean, the hip community was already really you know loving it from when it ran as a column at mass appeal um and when it you know the ig and you know yeah, bringing it to the photo community this is um a great event called photo bill which if you're not familiar with you know once things are back up and normal definitely you should go check out they do it in brooklyn every fall and they were really the first to um you know, just say like, this is a really great project. This is a really interesting um, photo project because, you know, I think when you have a book or a project where there's so many like famous people and big names, a lot of times it just automatically about, people always gravitate towards like, oh my God, it's a picture of Jay-Z or oh my God, you know, and they kind of get away from these like core values of what I'm trying to say is like, think about the photographer, Think about their process. What was it about this artist that made this other artist special and have this moment and have this photo that was gonna represent who they were? Um, so um, these are the book pages. You know, it really starts in 1979 when hip hop was, you know, still a very neighborhood thing. So I wanted to make sure that the contact sheets and the images and the photographers that we were focusing on, photographers like Joe Conzo, Ricky Flores, Martha Cooper, were photographers that were really um, from certain communities, um, really, you know, were documenting hip hop, not because, you know, they thought they could sell these photos somewhere or because they were being hired to do so, but because they, realized that something important was happening in their neighborhood, something important was happening in the culture, and they needed to point their camera at it. So you'll see, you know, a lot of the contact sheets are like not perfect. Not everyone was a professional photographer. In fact, most people were not. Um, and along with artists, they also photographed the neighborhood. So here you have like 
Sophie Bramley's photos of the Bronx and you have Fab Five Freddy at, you know, at White Castle. But, you know, when you look at these in-between moments from the iconic image, you see the neighborhoods, you see the crew that they were hanging out with, you see um, just how much, you know, New York has changed, how much the Bronx has changed. Um, and then, you know, I also wanted to make sure that, you know, there's these iconic images like this biggie by Baron Claiborne, uh, King of New York, um, it's called. And this image, you know, everyone knows. I mean, it, it was carried through big funeral procession. It was originally for the cover of Rat Pages magazine. Um, and, you know, looking at the contact sheet, well, you, which you'll see here, you know, there is that one frame of Big smiling. And Baron was saying, you know, he wanted to photograph Biggie as a, a West African king. He's like, when I saw him, I wanted to do something that really was counter to the images of young black men that he was seeing in the media at the time. This photo was taken in 97. And so, um, you know, whenever you show this contact sheet to people that knew Big, they always hone in on that smiling one and they're like, oh, that's the biggie that we knew. Like that joking, funny. Um, so I wanted to just bring up the topic in this book too of like how media choices are made and how certain decisions that are made about an artist in any given time that lives on um, is sometimes who they really are, sometimes not who they really are. So nowadays artists are a lot more um, introspective about how they do things. I think they're a lot more intentional about which images get out in the public um, and how they control things. Um, this is Brian's, uh, you know, ODB cover. Um, I think nowadays too, you know, photographers and artists are thinking a lot more about, um, you know, just like masculinity and identity and the role of women. Um, this photo, I'll, you know, let B plus maybe talk about it later, but it's actually got quite an interesting story from the perspective of, you know, respecting women and things like that. Um, this was actually a play on an old Rolling Stone cover that Janet Jackson um, and Patrick DeMarchelier did, but I'll let Brian speak on that story. This is another um, photo from the book. This is Goody Mob uh, in Atlanta, and B Plus photographed this also for the cover of Rap Pages. Um, you know, a lot of these early images were, like I said, were for these, you know, indie magazines that were really covering culture when the bigger media was not. Um, another thing I wanted to show in the book was artists sort of on the brink, right? We think of all these big artists right now. Um, you know, Nas, Jay-Z, Kendrick, like we think of them as so commercial and we also think of photographers as taking all these perfect shots. And what I wanted to show was, look at the artists on the brink of like making it, right? Look at them making their mistakes. Look at them uh, working it out. Look, look at them figuring it out. And look at the photographers also learning not getting the right shot at the, you know, at, at the first time, um, you know, not free shot work. Some were overexposed, underexposed, but just being there and, and, and really showing that process, I think is so important because nowadays he is so perfect. You know, you see, cause we're, we live in an age of visuals where you see everyone's Instagram you, and you hear finished products. So I feel like that process and the mistakes of becoming who you are is really important nowadays more than ever. Um, you know, you see a young Lauren Hill. We, I want to also talk about, you know, women in hip hop and how they have evolved and set their own identities. Um, and, and really, you know, that there's really no one right way to be, be a woman. Um, you see women like, Lauren, you know, you see women like Latifah here with her mom and her dancers. Um, you see Mary J. Blige, you see Aaliyah. Um, and, you know, and in the exhibition, we have, you know, more recent photos, Cardi B. Um, so I wanted to have that conversation of the 
the role of women in hip hop and not just a, like, can you be sexy or do you have to be a tomboy? Like those are overly simplified um, ways of looking at it. Um, I also, you know, well, just to go back for a minute and also just to like celebrate Delphine and all the women that are in this book, I hear a lot um, from people that are like, oh, you have so many women photographers in this book. Like, how did you find them? We didn't know that women were photographing hip hop so deeply. You know, we hear the common names that you hear all the time of male photographers, but, you know, we didn't know that women like Delphine um, or Sophie Bramley or, you know, like people know Jeanette Beckman, but Jeanette and just how many women were out there, part of the culture, photographing, pounding the pavement. So, you know, not just women artists, but also, you know, so many women photographers that were doing it. Um, so these photos, and sorry, I'm a terrible editor. I have a lot of, <laughs> of, my, of my own slides. Um, I have a lot of slides, so I just wanted to show you guys a variety of imagery that's, that's in the book. This is Public Enemies, It Takes the Nation of Millions to Hold a Stat Cover by Glenn Friedman. Um, as you can see, you know, sometimes the group and the photographer have different ideas about which photos are ultimately taken. Um, and all that work is kind of done like right on the content she, um, this is Gordon Parks, um, a photographer who did not photograph hip hop that, that widely, but towards the end of his career, um, Sheena Lester, who was the um, amazing uh, editor at Double uh, XL Magazine at the time, uh, wanted to recreate an old jazz photo, which was also on the same block in Harlem. Um, and she wanted to recreate it sort of like a class picture for hip hop in 1998. Um, so if you look at this photo closely, I mean, anyone who's everyone um, at the moment, at hip hop at the moment was in here. There are a few people missing for various reasons, but you know, you see right in the fr front row, you see Cool Herc, you see Coke LaRock, you see Fat Joe, you see Slick Rick, Fat by Freddy, Rakim, Styles P, um, you know, it's, it, and then in the background you see um, Common, uh, Amir from The Roots, um, Questlove, Black Thought. So this photo um, was photographed by Gordon Parks and it was really important because a photographer that had spent, you know, his life really photographing Black identity um, and cultural moments to photograph hip hop, which was still, I guess, um, not why, you know, respected across the board by all media. Um, it was important and it was a statement and, you know, Sheena Lester and the whole team at XXL um, really understood that. And so this photograph, um, you know, and also you look at these stoops in Harlem now, they look very, very different in many ways. So um, just a really, you know, amazing photo. Um, and we have the contact sheet in the book. Um, we have photo, this is a follow the leader photo by Drew Carillon, uh, Tupac by Danny Clinch, you know, a lot of amazing like portraiture that happened. Uh, this photo by Danny Clinch, who also shot Nas's Illmatic, uh, Big L, lots of um, important covers and work, um, is just, you know, a beautiful classic portrait, whether it's of Tupac or anyone really. Um, and it's a quiet moment for him at a time that was really tumultuous in his life. Um, so again, just speaking to the power of like how photographers interact with their subjects and who they're photographing and that level of trust that's really, really important. Um, speaking of like <laughs> the level of trust to let someone, you know, come into your space and let, let you take their photograph, getting, getting your hair cut on a video set, another iconic photo. Um, also, uh, you know, Jay -Z, this is another, you know, important magazine for hip hop, Stress Magazine. Um, this is Jay-Z photographed by Danny Hastings in front of the Twin Towers, of course. You know, Jay really um, was very conscientious, 
conscientious early on about where he was photographed and what that signified. Um, this is the time when he was um, photogra uh, starting up Rockefeller. Um, his office was in that neighborhood and they went up on the roof of Rockefeller because he really wanted to signal to the world that he was building something that was going to be important. And so um, to him, you know, this photograph symbolized, symbolized that. Um, and then this is, <laughs> you know, the one on the right was Jay's first press shoot by Jamil GS. Um, and then on the left is his um, later shoot by Danny Clinch, where he didn't want any symbols of wealth. He just wanted himself. He had already, you know, built that confidence um, of who he was. So um, also, you know, photographs by Jamel Shabazz, also another important, you know, community photographer. Um, people often say like, oh, he captured hip hop style. Um, but really, he captured it at a time where you really couldn't separate it from the neighborhood or what, you know, places look like um, back in the 80s. Um, and then, you know, this is a great uh, uh, contact sheet that we unearthed during the process of the book. Um, it's Tupac with Nas and Redman um, and uh, a friend of Nas's who passed away draws in the background. Um, and this, you know, was important because there had never been a photograph of Nas and Tupac together, I guess, until we shared this in our Instagram and then this photograph kind of took on a life of its own. Um, and then newer artists, you know, and this will kind of lead us into the conversation, but newer artists um, like, you know, ASAP, Rocky, and Kendrick, sort of how they are building their kind of visual history, um, letting photographers in on these moments of them, you know, becoming artists and what they look like and making album cover choices. You know, this photo of ASAP Rocky is from Long Live ASAP. Um, you know, using certain symbols like the American flag and what that communicates and what he wants to say. Um, and so newer artists, you know, definitely still that process is the same in many ways, right? It's trust, it's finding a photographer who captures you um, and working with them and letting them in. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Delphine to talk about her work a little bit. Um, Delphine, you know, I, I put your Mob Deep photos in here because um, that that is what is in the book. Um, and you, you know, went to Queensbridge um, right before their album came out and spent the day with them and photographed them and their friends. So um, talk, yeah, talk a little bit about this photo and, um, and kind of how you got into to shooting. Okay, I was on assignment for a beatdown magazine. And um, at the time, you know, it was just buzz on the street about this group called Mob Deep. I had no idea what they looked like. And I also hadn't heard the music as yet. Because back then we're talking about um, a, a tape, you know, they had the, the release, the um, pre-tapes coming out. What they used to call them? Like the pre-cassettes or something? Before the album came out, it'll be this cassette that you had. So I did have the cassette with me, but I, I didn't listen to it as yet. It was just kind of like, okay, go out there. You're going to get these shots of these people. I was excited about going to Queens Bridge just because of the history of the place. You know, that's one of the birthplaces of early hip hop, right? So, you know, I think even when I was there, I, was pro I probably had like, you know, the bridge, the Booger Bridge in my head, right? Because this is like Queens Bridge. So it was really exciting um, just to be there. Like, go out. I, I remember in the beginning, we went to, um, at, through our interview, we found out that that was Havoc's um, mom's house that we went to first. And I literally felt like, I don't know, for those of you who knows what it's like to grow up in an apartment building in New York City and you're young and you go and you're waiting for your friends to come outside so you're at the door. And so we were all at the door. I literally had that moment, like when you peek inside out of respect and you say, good afternoon, you know, miss, I'm just here waiting, you know, you don't want to barge into people's homes and everything. Just that. But so it was so, I'm saying that it was very family oriented, right? Just being in that space. And then as we just started to shoot, like as soon as they stepped out into the hallway, 
if you look at this particular contact sheet, you'll see it started in this started in their hallway and it ended up on the rooftop. Then we went outside and we were just kind of I, I didn't I wasn't really too much into the um just the strictly posy posy photos, but I wanted it to feel like we were moving through their everyday experiences. Like and they pretty much we went to the rooftop. We went outside, all their boys were there. They got some, there's another um, contact sheet in front of the corner store. Every moment that you could think about a day just hanging out with your friends in the hood was in this. And um, for me, that's visually what you get when you listen to the music, right? When you listen to hip hop, the special thing about hip hop, especially back then, is that it's like the first album was talking about where you were from. And it was giving life and giving feeling to where you, where you represented. And so uh, I wanted to get that feel visually. So that's what that was. And then afterwards, you know, after the shoot, I popped the tape into my um, headset, my Walkman. <laughs> and I was like, oh my, I was completely blown away. I was like, this is a classic. What? Like, this is hard. Like, this was everything. That album was, of course, that album was dope. So, and then I think later on that day was a release party if I remember co correctly, it was either them or, um, or Smith and Wesson. I think they both had release dates around the same time. Um, but yeah, so that's what it was. Another day in New York City shooting hip hop back in the 90s. Yeah, and this this is another you know photo, Delphine, you took of a young Lauren. Um, and I'll just kind of toggle a little bit because um, it's from this photo. So, you know, oops, sorry. Ah, wait. <laughs> Sorry about that. So yeah, so Here we go. yeah. This photograph came about with me um, and a friend of mine, Kristen, who's probably in the in the audience. Um, back then, we both used to photograph hip hop together, and um, we wanted to do some writing to go along with it, like not in depth writing, but you know, kind of the writing that we could do to kind of spark conversations about different issues. And so, one of the issues that we thought was necessary to have was what what was it like to be a woman in hip hop, you know? Here we all were, women in this male dominated um, industry that with this music that we loved, but we knew that there was a lot of issues that needed to be discussed. So we um, pitched to the Source magazine, and at the time, Kierna Mayo was the editor, and so she loved the idea and she was like, go for it. And that time, like, we, we pretty much reached out to everyone. We, we did everything on our own, organized the shoot. We um, went up to um, Nikki Nicole's house. I think this was in front of her brownstone. And we had some, back then I, I ate chicken. <laughs> we had some chicken wings, some barbecue chicken wings. We were all sitting around, had the recorder going, and we had a round table discussion about so many issues. And it wasn't, it wasn't really so much about, um, you know, it's hard for me. It was about what is my vision? You know, like I remember um, um, Nikki D, no, not Nikki D, um, Nefertiti. Nefertiti, she was talking about the importance of investment. I remember Lauren Hill saying that she wasn't signing any record deals until her, um, her record company dis, um, agreed to pay for her college tuition. You know, so we were talking about things like that, you know what I mean? Like these were, were very smart, forward thinking people who were talking about where they wanted to see their communities grow, like what they thought was important about that growth, like what messages they were trying to infuse into the community. It was a really, really um, important conversation. Unfortunately, what happened is at that point, there was a lot of political drama that happened at the source, so the, the story never ran. Oh. And we had, we well, never shout, shout, out to, shout out to women editors, you know, I think um, oh, yeah. they often, you know, when we talk about women and hip hop, you think artists, photographers, but there were so many, you know, I mentioned Sheena earlier, but Kierna, you know, Mimi Valdez at the source, Dream yeah. Hampton, like that early um, wave of women editors, um, at these magazines were just really um, important. So shout out oh, yes, to them. Definitely on the writing side and even execs. Me, yeah. I started off as an intern at um, MCA Records. And so I had a lot of just experience and I ended up working as a, as a publicity assistant there too. But behind the scenes, there were so many women of color yeah. behind the scenes, for yep. sure. 
Lisa, you know, so like, we could do a whole, yeah. Yeah, so it's just really interesting to, to share that as well, like how many people were, because it was this, it was like a, it was a really hands-on thing. Maybe people just didn't know what it was, what was really happening. Like these big conglomerates, they were like, oh, we'll give you some dollars. Go do what you want to do over here. And, but really these people were setting the ground for what will become this big thing today. And that, that was, you know, was, and, and then unfortunately as record labels became smaller and buying up and this, and then you saw a lot of those people being weeded out and doing other things. So, um, but it's interesting, it's really important to say that, that, you know, all of the, you went behind the scenes and everything from the a &R to, you know, the head of the company, there was just a lot of people who knew this music, knew the culture and was really a force behind it. Yeah, li lived and breathed it for sure. Mm -hmm. So um, quickly, and I'm sorry we're moving so quickly through this, but um, I wanted to just um, point out your more recent work because of course, you know, you started out photographing hip hop in the community. Um, and, you know, followed, followed that um, through line, I guess, and, and now really champion, you know, women photographers of the African diaspora. You put out a book with, um, you know, two co-authors, and really it's just turned into this amazing, you know, celebration of your work, um, you know, a lot of your, you know, self-portraiture here. Um, and well, this is going back to your hip hop work a little bit there, but you know, photographs, I mean, you travel so widely through Africa, you know, Nigeria, Ghana. Um, and so just quickly, you know, to, to end with, like for, for your portion, like talk about what was, what's the through line between that early photography, you know, in Queensbridge and the like to now this, you know, pho pho photographing the world and, and identity as, as a woman. Yeah, I mean, um, so I grew up on hip hop. It's important to say that. So when I was, um, when I, when it got to the point when I, that I started to document, it was right after college. And I was um, really informed about what, what black culture and what black diaspora culture meant in the world. And so when I saw hip hop, I knew this is it. This is going to be something Cute. Like 50 years from now, people are going to be writing books. It's going to be, I knew that this was going to happen. And so I was doing that thing that, you know, Ida B. Wells was doing or that James Baldwin, I was doing that as a photographer. And I was just carrying on that tradition of someone who was going to continue the storytelling. And so this thing, there's a, a the common line is that I found myself in, um, in hip hop because I saw something that related to my lineage as a person who was African. I saw the language, they were speaking hip hop, we were speaking Mende, but it was the same syntax. You understand? It was like the same way of making new languages using words. So it was Creole, like in, in Sierra Leone, they speak Creole, which is a language that uses English words, but it has an African syntax. Hip hop is that. So I, was, I just saw myself, and that's what I was documenting. Do, um, you know, Mfana is really celebrating women photographers of the African diaspora. So that's what that book is about. My, um, and I did it, shout out to Leila Amatula Bahrain, who is the co-founder and editor with me, and Crystal Whaley, who is also one of the early, you know, the, a part of the team who um, published this book. Yeah, and Leila um, and them, they're amazing photographers in their own right. Yeah, so my work wasn't in that yeah. book. Um, it was really about celebrating those women and showing, like, anytime someone says, oh, we can't find any women photographers, here's a resource now that lives in universities <laughs> across the world. Um, in terms of the work in, you know, I was really interested in 2008 to see what happened in this hip-hop cipher. I knew that hip-hop was inherently influenced by the DNA of what was going on centuries ago in different parts of Africa. I knew that was the language, but I also knew that hip hop influenced current day young people as well, and that there was a cipher happening. Like it's not like people in Ghana or Nigeria were copying, but they were in communication in a visual, in a spiritual, what I think, communication across the waters, making music in a different way, growing up on the same music that I was listening to, you know what I mean? So I wanted to go to Ghana, I wanted to go to Nigeria, Sierra Leone, to all these different places and see what was happening there. And that's what these photographs are. So um, like that, the picture with all the heads on the beach was a massive concert 
um, in Ghana, hair. And I mean, I had never been, I, it was just incredible. But this was a hip hop concert that was happening on the beach back in 2008. So I've been doing that from since 2008 until now. So the work is this expansive conversation about these people across the diaspora having this conversation of new language. You know what I mean? We could call it hip, you know, whatever those expressions are. That's what I'm really interested in. That's what I'm interested in with my personal work as well, which is our self-portraits where I am looking at um, creating new identities, drawing from way, you know, long, long, long histories and having conversations about new identities, you know, in the world of, um, for people of African descent. Amazing. All right. Thank so you. we're going we're gonna to move to Brian. <laughs> no, only because I just peaked at the time and uh, we got 10 minutes until we open it to Q&A. So yeah, but but just really quickly, Delphine, you know, Joe mentioned earlier, you know, we, we got we focus on the story, we, we have to like engage you more and just hear more about your work. Because, like I said, you know, putting this together, you just go down the rabbit hole of exploring your expression. But uh, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. Thank you. So, Brian, Vicky, Vicky yeah. don't don't worry about the um, uh, rushing through Brian or Amos. Just just uh, take your time. We'll we'll, do, we'll deal okay. with the. All right, all right. Thank you. So, B plus, um, who is just you know great human being. So I'm a big fan of his work and just his person in general. Um, you know, he. I'll just kind of go through quickly and then we can we can stop but you know his photographs you know have have this through line right and there's this kind of melon melancholy i guess if you will you know brian i know you you've told me before that you know there's been photo editors and such that say like your photos all have this kind of melancholy to them um i don't know if that's the irish <laughs> irish thing coming out or what but um but they're all beautiful. But what, you know, what I, I really think of you as, you know, someone who loves the music first and foremost, somebody, you know, that collects records, that nerds out on breaks, that, you know, nerds out on even, you know, the music that, you know, hip hop sampled and whatnot. Um, but, uh, you know, talk talk a little bit about what drew you to this. Um, I mean, you moved to LA in in the '90s and just sort of found your way to a music that was kind of, you know, just getting getting known outside of the LA community, if you will. Um, talk about how you got from there to here. Um, thanks, Vic, uh, and thanks, Delphine. I actually, never heard you speak at length like that and it was very nice um yeah i'm i'm irish <clears throat> um and i was but i was listening to hip i mean hip-hop had made it to ireland in the in the early 80s um and i came to the u.s for the first time in 88 and i lived in san francisco in the mission district and by a kind of extraordinary fluke um, at the end of the street that I lived in was this uh, thrift store called Community Thrift, which was the first um, thrift store that uh, was raising money for AIDS research, believe it or not. And as a result, had just a, a massive amount of 12 inches um, that were belonged to DJs that were donated or whatever. So, I, yeah, I, that was the real kind of break out to try and understand the the music and the culture but I, but similar to Delphine I would say like it seemed fairly obvious to me fairly quickly that like what we were witnessing in that moment was something that was like um to me it felt like the most important culture of that this generation had produced and, and in retrospect I think it's perhaps the most important um, singularly the most important thing in, in popular culture since at least since the Second World War, you know, but uh, obviously I was in art school and on a whole other trajectory making like landscape photo photographs about um, history, really thinking about trying to think about history. And then I came to LA to go to grad school and then was kind of at a loss a little bit really in terms of what to photograph because my work in Ireland had been so rooted in 
my my personal history, my family history, the history of the country or whatever. Um, and then through discussions with a number of folks, I mean, it's it's something I always say as well, like whatever makes your, it's, it's the old Chris Marker quote, which is whatever it makes your heart beat faster, pay attention to that. And hip hop at, in that time, I was a proper fan, you know, like, at a in a period where being a fan meant being an advocate as well so i was always like yo you should listen to this like have you heard this whatever whatever I think um, i'll just jump just for one second like because yeah. that word fan is because i always say that too i was like i was a fan first and foremost you know before i got that job before and nowadays i think people say it it's kind of has this negative connotation like you're a fan girl or you're a fan boy yeah. but you know i i always say it with pride and i think people a lot of people from that generation is like for hip hop whether you were a photographer or whatever you were, you were a fan first and foremost. Delphine, I'm sure you know you agree. That's why, right? You were ahead. That's why you put the headphones in your ear after you left Queensbridge and you know walked down the street. Like so, I just wanted to say like shout out to that term because it's it it signifies love. I think. Yeah. No, I mean part part of the part of the kind of exciting uh, part of. You know, doing this gig in an era where there was no money and there was no fame involved or anything like that of the sort was that you did get the advanced cassette basically so i mean that was your i have my little cultural cachet i was like yo i got that new mob deep yo <laughs> but um so yeah so i so basically through a series of discussions at, at grad school um I was prompted to go, why don't you go photograph? And I don't know, I just felt in my mind that because probably there's somebody really good doing this already. And well, actually, what I've kind of come to realize was that there were folks photographing hip hop, like Mike Miller, like um, who's in the book, was one of those people. But Mike wasn't a particularly a hip hop head per se, you know, like he was somebody who was a commercial photographer who knew those dudes socially, some of them. And then, you know what I mean? But like, I'll respect dude to, to, to Mike, but like when I actually kind of get into it with him, I realize like, I mean, he's more interested in fo photography than he is in hip hop somehow. And where I was, I always felt like, I mean, at least I can bring a level of seriousness to it. And there was, you know, the kind of program I was in, there were people, the, the, the kind of current, the phrase at the time was to have an integrated practice. So it's like if you went into a community and you were making work, then the work should make sense to that community first. And so I just, I did some things that, you know, people would be like, what? Um, but like, I was always listed. I was, and, I, and anybody that had a good demo and was interested in, you know, putting together a package or whatever, uh, if they were decent people, I would, I did, I would work for free. Mm -hmm. and to be honest, it, like that's a lot of the sort of photographs that I'm known for now came from those kinds of exchanges. You know, the DJ shadow came from those kinds of exchanges. You know, there's a lot of people I met in that era because basically just because I was down, you know, I was like, yeah, I'll show up and make photos. Fine. No, you know, I'll figure out a way to cover the lab bill or a lot of times I'll process the film myself or whatever. And I just, you know, I was an immigrant. I just come from Ireland. Um, and little by little, I start to, you know, become engaged with the community. You know, people would call me when there was events, please come, bring your camera out, of course. And people still say, it's just cute, but um, like, oh, you don't want me to come? You just want me to bring the camera? But. Uh, <laughs> Brian, talk, about, talk about then, you know, you then, you know, of your, your position as a photo editor. Um, because it's one thing, you know, to be a photographer, but then another thing to step into this role as a photo editor at a magazine that is exclusively covering the culture. Um, talk about what that meant to you, what, how you saw that just hip hop coverage in general, um, being written about, being photographed at that time. Um, what was, and I know like you were so young and that staff, you guys had a ton of fun. So I don't mean to make it overly intellectualized, if you will. You know, I know like <laughs> a lot of stuff you guys were just, you know, laughing and nerding out on and 
just doing it as it was as it was, it was live. But um, you know, certainly being in control, if you will, or being the decision maker of who got assignments, what photographs made the cover. Um, talk about that in the context of you know that time period. Yeah, I mean, the, I had done a few things for Sheena at Rap Pages. Rap Pages was like the I don't know, it was like the, the you know, another office in Larry Flint's publishing <laughs> empire that nobody paid any attention to, basically. I mean, we were, we basically made up, nobody really cared so long as we weren't losing money, you know, and, and, and to be honest, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, Sheena made it a very successful enterprise. I mean, we start to figure out really quickly, um, you know, like how we could, you know, certain artists, certain kinds of coverage, certain kinds of stories where people were responding. And it was weird. Like, I mean, it was in a period where there was a certain amount of animus out here that like in Los Angeles, because the source was so New York and so New York centric, as the culture was New York centric at that time, um, that there was, there was a lot of interesting stuff happening outside of New York that wasn't getting very much coverage. And Sheena was always interested in, in stories of like, you know, in, you know, like the Master P story or the Too Short story or the E-40 story, stories of people that are building different kinds of lanes and stuff. Anyway, after doing the, you know, getting involved in taking photos and then seeing how it turned out, I just I remember telling Sheena, like, you know, we need to get our own designer and we need to get our own photo editor. And, she, and in the middle of the conversation, she was like, well, how much would that person cost? And I knew she was asking me. And I was like, I just thought like, okay, my rent, which was like 350 bucks and my utilities. And so I said like, if you can give me 500 bucks an issue, I'll do it. And, um, and then I, honest to God, like I had done grad school in photography, but that was really the, that was really learning the side of the of photography that they don't teach you about in schools really for the most part which is about how people present themselves and how you you know how you make a portfolio how you manage things like tears how you you know and 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 beginning to think about like what you know who's out there in the community of people that are the right kinds of people to photograph you know hip-hop and i remember finding you know Eric Johnson, for example, and being just like, wow, this guy is fucking amazing. You know, he's amazing. We got to get him on board. Um, I remember, you know, I mean, Danny Hastings, same way. I mean, and, and it was great because I felt like it was, it made a difference. Like the little checks that we could pay, you know, I mean, they, it made a big difference to folks. And it, and it meant that, um, I don't know, it was such a small community of people that it felt, I don't know, to me, I felt like, you know, it was like any opportunity I had to support folks that were doing things. And it would be competitive sometimes, you know, like I'd be up against Danny for an album cover job or up against Eric or whatever, but it was never, you know, it was like a cottage industry. I remember somebody saying at that time, it's a cottage, we, we were working in this cottage industry and that's what it was like. You know, there wasn't, it. things changed really after 94, I think. Is thing where things really began to sort of speed up and change and big money got involved. But in that period, like in that early period, it was very, you know. And, and you, you got, you know, it, you got a lot of access. You know, I want to go, I mean, we'll, we'll pause here for a minute, but, um, you know, this very famous, you know, cipher photo. But I want to sort of, Transition in the conversation from you to Amos with this photo talking about access, you know, this of course is the dungeon family um, in Atlanta um, in their dungeon, uh, you know, you see, see the, yeah, 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 I mean, you, yeah, and this, this is an outtake from your cover photo, right, it was the same session, same couple days that you were out there with them, um, yeah. but Talk about the level of access that you were getting and could you have even taken half the photographs if, you know, Goody Mob was like, okay, we'll meet you at the studio for an hour and that's it versus going here with them. Yeah. I mean, it's true that 
there was a lot less, you know, there was no publicist involved. Do you know what I mean? That was the first thing. I mean, it was like we met them. It was me and Brent, and we went and met them. And then we Brent had, Rollins, who was the art director. Yeah. Had out Brent. It was very much like them being absolutely charmed with the notion that there was basically two net, nationwide you know, national hip hop magazines and they were going to be on the cover of one of them. And that was just Sheena basically being like, when we break people, it works bigger for us. The source won't break people. The source needs to see advertising dollars before they'll put people on the cover. We, we don't need to do that. We're, we're not the, the same kind of operation. So that allows us to do something different. So of course, Outcast was already making noise, but this first, uh, I remember the first Goody Mob uh, single was, you know, was huge on BT, and 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 Sheena was like, "Nah, this is something new. We need to pay attention." And so we go there, and then it's like, you know, they're so just hyped at the notion that like they're going to be on the cover. It's unheard of. They don't have a record yet. Um, but I would say, you know, there were also times. Like, I'll just tell a story. I, I remember when Tribe Called Quest came to LA to do the Arsenio Hall show to do Scenario, and it was like they had, you know, it was Tribe and Leaders. You know, they, I was shooting the Freestyle Fellowship the same day, and they were looking to hook up trees. And they so they called Freestyle yeah. Fellowship. So we were, you know, when, when in the era of block phones, the big old phones. And I remember going there to the Mondrian Hotel, which is where, Arsenio used to host his guests or whatever and go into a room and them having a cipher, which was tribe leaders and freestyle fellowship. And, and Snoop for some reason was in the same hotel and he came in and the only rule was no photos. <laughs> and I saw so I sat there with my camera in my hand and it was mind but I mean, it was, you know, if we had video cameras in those days, that 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 shot video. <laughs> um, I remember it was five, yeah. I think, and I think Busta, I don't remember. But I mean, Fellowship would have been cool with me taking photos, but they were, you know, but yeah. So it was, you know, I mean, it, it, there were moments too where you where it was better to keep your camera in your bag and to chill. I mean, there was, you know, at least for me, I'm sure it's different for everybody, but at least for me, it was, yeah. you know, well, there I were moments. That's, where it that's all part of the trust factor, right? Because if yeah. you do, do that in certain moments, you know, you get invited back to the site for the next time and, you know, and then yeah. you get photos. So, yeah. Sure. Um, all right. Any, anything you want to, you, you want to add real quick before we. No, I'm good, man. Let's <laughs> share the time and more okay. time for questions. Okay. Um, so Amos. Um, by the way, do you want to be called by your moniker or by your first name here? I get called by both all the time, so I okay. honestly don't even know. It's just, okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, hey, we'll let hey, Amos and Vicky, really quickly, um, we're going to open for questions in about another five to seven minutes, all right? Perfect. Okay. Right. So, real quick, Amos, I'll let you, you know, talk. I mean, you are you know, a new, the new generation um, of photographers. Um, you know, this is the photo I referred to earlier of X at Rolling Loud. Um, if you know that this is the only photograph that's on X's um, Instagram. Um, and, you know, this is, this is an outtake from that shoot. And, you know, all of the new artists, Travis Scott, Future, um, and I also put a, put a little bit in here of also just your personal work, which is also equally, you know, incredible. But talk about what it's like for you, who's getting into photography now as a music journalist. Um, talk about what it takes to get shots like this and sort of what drew you to what's happening now in music. Um, to get shots like that, it's either you can apply um, you can uh, go through a media publication or you can just sneak in with your camera and try to go for it. You know, like me, like this is, this, this was a hobby and I like to consider it still as a hobby because it's something that I have a passion for. 
So like this, I I just went, I just applied and I got accepted, but it, I didn't get paid. Applied for a, pre a press pass for those. Of yeah, for a press okay. pass. Okay. A press so pass. I got approved for it and I went and I shot it. I didn't get paid not a dollar for it. I had to buy my own ticket, but I saw it as an opportunity to showcase that I can that I can, because people enjoyed my photos of just like portraiture or street before music photography. So I felt like I can, I can uh, just, just blow people's minds away with what I would get there. And it, it paid off, you know, he, he posted it, it became a uh, top second photo uh, on IG with the most likes, um, the Guardian, um, wrote about it and it's like on the top 10 photos of the decade or something like that so it definitely paid off it got some recognition it got people looking at me you know so it's definitely uh, one of those photos that helped my career I guess go to like a next level yeah Mm -hmm. and what is like what does that mean for a young artist so you said you started out <laughs> just loving, you know, the music, being an amateur photographer, getting these shots, boom, all of a sudden you take this picture of X and you're sort of in this, you're on people's radars. Yeah. So, and so now that you get on people's radars, um, what does that mean for you? Like now, what, how do you structure your career as a photographer? Um, is your access increased now? Do you have artists directly reaching out? Um, what was, yeah, what's this kind of new normal after this moment? So yeah, after this, you do have uh, more access, more, I guess, people I can hit up and ask for like favors, like, yo, I want to shoot this show or whatever, you know? Um, I, I've, I have built relationships with a couple artists that I can just, that they just always hit me up or like, yo, um, can you shoot this for me? Or, um, yo, can you just come to the studio and listen to, like Brian said, like sometimes you just chill, you know, like, and I like to do that. I like to just live in the moment sometimes. So that that's definitely helped. I have people like calling my phone for gigs and stuff. So it's a blessing, you know, that I can do something that I'm really passionate about and, and, having, and having it looked as, as a career. So, yeah. Do you, do you feel like you are welcomed into moments that aren't necessarily these moments of greatness? You know, are you, do you feel like if you wanted to shoot, you know, Travis Scott, you know, in a quiet moment backstage, like. No, that, that is what, so that is what like, I would love to do. So this is why, like, when I take photos of artists, I like to compose them in a way where you don't see the stage lights, where you don't see, a, like, a lot of stuff. Because what I would like to do is really have a one-on-one -on -one session with them to get very intimate with the subject and just take those kind of photos that I would see that I saw at the Contact High exhibit. You know, like, cause you guys, what I've saw from like the uh, Delphine and Brian, those photos were amazing. Like that's stuff that I would wish I would get more often, but I'm, I'm sure it'll come my way, but that's why I wouldn't be able to do that with most of the artists yet. Yeah. Well, you, you know, so what I notice a lot um, in younger photographers is because you know, they're working into those kinds of moments with artists or no names, their personal work, you know, which I'm, you know, we're sharing here, their personal work sort of takes on that intimacy or vulnerability of more like traditional street photography um, and things like that. Like that's where they express those kinds of moments. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Excellent. So yeah, these, I love these, um, the black and white photos of yours. These are, are these are all in New York? Um, the one to the left is in Chicago and the two, the top right is in uh, Chinatown, New York. And the bottom right is in uh, my neighborhood where I grew up in Corona, Queens. 
Okay. Yeah. Now the, <laughs> the infamous name now. <laughs> yeah. When I went um to the Contact High Museum the first time, like I just recently got a medium format camera, like maybe two weeks prior to going to that museum. And just like uh, the exhibit, I mean, and I was just mind blown by all the photos and like physically seeing the contact sheets and stuff like that. And I just, I already purchased a, a second SLR camera just so I could have more than 10 shots, you know, just it's, it's, you guys are blessed. Like, is, is it, is it wrong for me to say, like, I wish I would like photograph like during your time, like, <laughs> like to Delphine or Brian? Nah. I totally right. understand the feeling. Okay, <laughs> I'm right. sure there are those photographers. There's that moment that you wish you had the opportunity. Like I wish I had the opportunity to photograph Fela Kuti. I just missed it because I wasn't. Gotcha. I wasn't a photographer then. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I. Thank you, thank you, Amos. Um, Vicky, can we? Were you going to show more of Amos's work? Or can no, we kind of go and see gonna, really good well, stuff? Uh, no, this is, this is, I was just going to share, you know, everyone's, um, socials. If you want to follow um, me or contact high or, you know, GNB plus or Amos, um, th these are all, all our handles. Um, so yeah, that's it. So I'll stop, I'll stop sharing now. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. We're just going to open it up for questions. Um, tons of really, really good questions in the um, Q&A box. I don't think we'll be able to get to every question, um, but Vicky, you shared everyone's handles. I don't think anyone would mind me saying this, but if you're attending, you know, feel free to reach out to these photographers and Vicky and uh, engage with them about their work. So, this question is the first question is from Salima Ali, and it's for you, Delphine. Um, let's see if Salima is still here. Mm -hmm. Salima, I'm just going to unmute you. Oh, you can hear them. Salima, are you there? Oh, are they going to actually ask the questions? I thought you I can ask the question. Yeah, but oh, I can ask it. <laughs> the, the question was more so around, you know, how long you've been doing, you know, practicing photography. And I guess, you know, this question is directed to you, but, you know, each of you could take a chance to, to just answer about y your, um, your practice in terms of how long you've been doing what you've been doing. Yeah, I, I, I first picked up the camera and called myself a photographer in 1993. So, in cool. a while. <laughs> and are you self-taught? Yes, I, um, I'm self-taught. Like you, Amos, I was self-taught and working at the same time. But then every time I wanted to learn something new, I would take a class. So I took um, classes in black and white. That's how I learned to develop on my own. I took a studio photography class working with four by five prints. So along the way, I, you know, and just learned from every photographer that I could around me. Same. Yeah. That's the best way to learn, actually, though. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Yeah. So we're going to go to the next question. I'll just read them off. Um, <laughs> the next question comes from Sharice May, who was a photographer herself. And this is also for that, uh, Delphine. Um, let's see if she can, she can join us here. Sharice does beautiful music photography, too. Sharice, are you there? In the Times right now photographing the times, the new art yeah. and everything. So she, she, she wanted to, yes, yes, hi. Hello everyone, hey Delphine. Hey Sharice, how you doing? Good. Good, good. So my question, well, first of all, I want to thank you and Layla for all you do with MFOM. Thank you. I think you. it's critical and um, it really gives great exposure um, to photographers of the African diaspora. Uh, so my question is, what would you say stands out when you did your, um, when you did the shoots where you went to Africa? Mm -hmm. um, what stands out to you um, with similarities or differences um, when you look at hip hop culture in Africa to New York City? Mm -hmm. Like, is there something that just jumped out at you? Like, man, like, I feel like I'm in New York or this yeah. is supposed to be Africa. 
Absolutely. When I went to Ghana, like I literally got goosebumps in the middle of a in, in the middle of an interview because what it felt like to me was being in New York City in the 90s in terms of how everyone had their own style. The new music was coming out, the new dances were coming out. You know what I mean? It was that fast pace, come out with your own style. This person does that, this one does that, this one does that. And it felt so much like home just to watch all the creativity happening at the same time. Mm-hmm. Another thing that was happening there and is still happening now is that what this, um, this whole industry was doing is doing is creating room for photographers, for videographers, for music video directors, producers. So there's this whole organic mm-hmm. industry booming where people are now self, you know, having their own jobs and everything, which is really important in different African cities right now. So the creative industry that's booming out of there, awesome. And it's interesting to watch that grow from 2008 to now, because now everybody knows Burner Boy and all of that stuff. But imagine like in 2000, like, are, are the states, are they ever going to know about this greatness that's coming out of Africa? <laughs> and now, you know, people are privy to it. And thinking about the moments, um, like Amos, like it's so interesting. You don't know, you never know who you're photographing. Like I got photographs of Burner Boy. I had no idea who he was. Mm. And I have archive photos of him. <laughs> from before he did his, you know. So it was just really interesting just because I, I'm, when I'm there, I'm there just like everyone is important as far as- Yeah, exactly, you know. you lo- and you love photography, you know? So exactly. You're, you're, you're just not taking a photo of somebody just because of who they are. You're also exactly. thinking mm-hmm. of you love it. Exactly. It shows in your work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sharice. Thanks, Sharice. So the, the next question is, is coming from Hampton Mitchell. and. Uh, it's not directed to anyone in particular, but Brian, I'm going to pick on you because you said you're Irish, right? Um, the question is, what is it like to be invited to these spaces where outsiders may or may not have been traditionally or at least looked at with skepticism? Essentially, the question is, what is it like to, not necess- to maybe be perceived as an outsider photographing a culture, you know, as an Irish dude photographing what is a Black? culture? I mean, it can be complicated sometimes, um, <laughs> as you might imagine. But, uh, you know, generally when I get asked this question, it, I take it as an opportunity just to talk about the kind of generosity that exists, um, which is a sort of undertold story, I think, very often, which is that generally people are, you know, part of this is having an opportunity to have a voice. And part of this is having an opportunity to share what it is that you do. Um, and generally that's, you know, that's the first thing that you, you know, that I, I mean, it's the first part of the story, the largest part of the story, I would say, um, when I'm given an opportunity to, to, to speak about this. But it's, cha- I mean, obviously it's, you know, it, 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 there are moments when it can be challenging. And I think there are moments when you have to, you know, like Amos was saying, I mean, there's moments to, to sit in your camera. I mean, I generally, I mean, I don't come in guns blazing. I mean, I'm not, you know, like, I'm more of the kind of person who comes into a place and hangs out for a while and catches a vibe and takes an opportunity to look at where the light is. And and just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Irish too, so, you know, I'm always up for the good conversation and the, you know what I mean, like things I may have noticed about the music or things I may have maybe able to contribute. There's, I mean, there's nothing better than being in a room for me than having an opportunity to contribute or to, you know, actually, you know, that comes from this or have you ever heard this or whatever, like those, the, you know, I mean, I think it has to feel like an exchange somehow, but the interesting thing about that question, because I'd read it right before you said it is, is, is that he prefaces the question by what is it like to be invited and, and, being invited to anything really is a is always an honor and a pleasure you know where it's more challenging is where it's like you kind of showed up because you came with somebody and then nobody really can co-sign for you or whatever um like the situation with tribe in them days you know i mean i ended up shooting a record cover for tip and i ended up you know like i work, work with busta a bunch in the in the 90s and early 2000s and got to know all them guys but I, as vicky said like it's true like i walked in with a bunch of la cats and that wasn't quite enough of a cosign for the the cats from New York who were out doing the Arsenio. So it can, you know, 
you just need to know when to sit on your camera and 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 real and and feel comfortable in that that the most important thing isn't your photo the most important thing is what's going on in the room you know very cool thank you you know you, you bring up an interesting i just want to ahead. quickly point out that we have another um one of our really important photographers that's in the chat danny hastings um what's up danny so i just wanted to um you know make sure we recognize that he's here and i want to just thank him uh he shot you know the cover of wu-tang's 36 chambers he shot gangstar pretty much you know several but hard to earn gangstar um so many like so many album covers of the mid 90s golden era so danny i just noticed is in the chat so i just wanted to hey danny and and you know to to thank you thank you and J danny thanks for joining um, danny, if you want to talk to him hey danny is his mic open we unmuted unmute him yourself, there you go i'm unmuting myself what's up danny? danny what's going on man how you doing ricky hi what's up ryan damn dude you got dressed up especially for it Okay. Oh man, I you know, I just that's the way I wake up. <laughs> <laughs> so one of one of the cool cool things about the project and I think, you know, hip hop and culture and just life in general is, you know, as one one of the as I was taking notes listening to all the stories, there's like this 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 thread of of um I think most of you have backgrounds as immigrants who've come to America and found this, this art form in hip hop and have used your art form in, in photography to kind of, I don't know, express what the, 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 the music and, and the culture is meant to you. Um, I think too often we see, you know, we, we kind of think of culture as not these, these shared vessels, but more so, um, you know, like this is black culture. And I think Vicky, our first conversation kind of touched on that. Um, and it, it it really opened my mind and my heart to this idea that, you know, as artists, we're really creating work in order to connect and share. Um, so I'll go to another question. Um, Vicky, did you have anything to add to that? No, I mean, I think you're right. You know, that we, we are all kind of, you know, immigrants from different parts. Um, I mean, my experience coming to Detroit um, and not really knowing, you know, what quote unquote white culture was and, you know, very much this, this, the outsiderness, I think, of being an immigrant kind of turns something on in your head where you observe first, right? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of us, you know, drawn to journalism, drawn to photography, because you know, we have questions about like, what is it that makes identity? What, where is it that, that I belong? Or like, we, I might have the same skin color as, you know, this white person from Detroit, but we have like no background in common. And so just even as a five-year-old, I found myself asking those questions. And, you know, a lot of what um, hip hop before it became so mainstream was an outside, you know, outsider culture mm -hmm. and kind of having your own thing that doesn't need validation from mainstream white culture or that doesn't need validation from mainstream culture. And as a kid who kind of felt like an outsider because of being an immigrant and being, you know, socioeconomically just growing up in a black community, I love that about hip hop and I was drawn to it. And at the time it was still kind of a small world, if you will, and not having to have a cosign from whiteness or, you know, wealth or this, I, I was drawn to the power in that. And so I wanted to do my part to build that or whatever that was. So, you know, it just felt, it still felt very small. And I think, the power of claiming your identity as an outsider, um, hip hop kind of built up that power, if you will, and, and gave people the platform to speak and to express themselves um, and to, to own that, right? And you yeah. know, it's amazing now to see sort of 
hip hop and the wider culture that it represents kind of like claiming its power. Like it makes, you know, it makes me so happy and proud to see that that happened because that's a big arc. But I think, I think, you know, it does draw, it did draw a certain kind of person, you know, in those days, because like Brian, you know, and Delphine said, we were not making big money. We were not, you know, paying our rent from photographing for Beatdown Magazine. <laughs> you know, we were doing this out of love and out of something that connected us and made us feel empowered as outsiders. Um, and so I think you really have to take yourself into that headspace because right now hip hop is so mainstream, it's hard to imagine that. Um, but truly that was, that was the thing. But for the young people listening, just to give you an idea of how you didn't hear hip hop music like growing up for me. I didn't hear it until after what was it after ten o'clock on WBLS or or Kiss. Like they had night radio that you had to wait. I remember my mom would be watching Miami Vice. I have on my headphones, sitting in front of the stereo to wait for DJ Red Alert or Molly Mall to spin, and that's where you heard the new songs. That's the only time you heard the new songs because I wasn't old enough to go club right at that time so imagine that right like that's when you heard it even before music videos like then it was like come home after school and watch video music box like that was it that's how you heard this music so you can understand how someone growing up in that way with this thing to actually watch it blossom but also like seeing its importance as it even because even in the 90s that was big that was big time right even as low-key as it was in the 90s the fact that there was a Def Jam record that came out you know what I mean? Like all these record companies getting bigger during that time. In the 80s, it was go sit in front of the radio and put on your headphones if you want to hear Eric B's new song. Well, you know we're, I mean? yeah. we're also having to physically go to the music. Yeah, yeah. Go, and you know, that's why I say like, you know, you nowadays can take a part of the culture, like take the best and not take the rest. Back in the day, if you were involved in hip hop, writing, like whatever it was, you took everything about it and you had to take yourself into those spaces or be in the, be comfortable in those spaces and be yourself. And, you know, just kind of like circling back to the original question, which was, you know, being an, a quote unquote outsider. I think the thing about hip hop that I've always loved and still remains true is it smells out of fake from a mile away, right? You got to be yourself. So that's what, that's where you earn your respect. And, and I think, you know, B plus did this, you know, I did this. It's like, come into the space and just be yourself and be respectful and be open and you will get that respect back, right? If you come in there trying to be, yeah, 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 da, 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 like, <laughs> they're gonna smell you out as a fake. So if your intent is real, and it's open and true, and only you can know that, people are gonna sense that. And, and that's cool. ultimately, you know, the best advice for anyone. Yeah. So we're, yeah, we're, I, I kind of agree, if I may say something. Go ahead, Danny, know? I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I never really see, saw myself in a, as, as an outsider, you know, I am from Panama, um, you know, I'm Latino and I came to New York City, you know, around the late eighties and most of my neighborhood was Latino and black. So black and Latino. And, you know, from very early, there was a lot of, uh, Latino, you know, contributions to hip hop that, you know, we were also, you know, part of that. Right. So coming from Panama, which is predominantly Caribbean. You know, we have like reggae, reggaeton, you know, obviously, you know, reggaeton was created there with El General. And, um, you know, it, it felt sort of like, to me, it was like, oh, I'm here, you know? It's like, this yeah. is me, this, this is what I love. And, and uh, even, even early in Panama, like in 86, we were already like starting to break dance. Like we didn't, you know, it was just like automatically going there like that. So when I came to New York, um you know it felt i felt like it was it was for me it was part of me it was who i was you know um everyone around me had like the latest you know eric b and rakim booking down productions when you know public enemy came out we all had it it was it was so um 
you know, yeah, I'm an immigrant, but I never saw myself. It was inclusive. I, yeah, 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 I never saw myself as an outsider. And uh, it was beautiful, man. And I think that when I brought in uh, photography into the picture, when I, I want to give you the respect that rock and roll, you know, music, photography is giving them, and I bring that to hip hop, you know, they were like, wow, you could do this? It was, it was more embraced because I was one genuine about it. And, you know, I created things like 36 Chambers album cover when nobody before that ever seen any album like that being treated like that, right? Yeah. Where the music sounded like the actual picture and the picture looked like the music. Right. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the cohesion of, of, of the two different art forms. Yeah, and it, and it was like surreal. It was like surreal, yeah. and, you know, science fiction. Thing. It was woo. Yeah, exactly. Right. So <laughs> it's very woo. You know, yeah. Yeah. And so once I was able to bring that into into it, you know, that was another level of like a Danish part of us. And I do that. At one point, I did like 35 album covers in one year. It was crazy. You know, yeah. That's, that's when so, the money started coming in, the album covers <laughs> in the mid nineties. Yeah. And so I have, I, I'm, I'm gonna kind of consolidate a, a bunch of questions into a question for Amos. Um, as, as you're kind of documenting hip hop, kind of current, the current state of hip hop, so to speak, or, or this current scene, right? You know, um, Delphine, Brian, um, you guys talked about having this um, awareness around the significance of the, of the work that you were doing in the time that you were doing it, right? And obviously a lot of these contact sheets were retained and, you know, Vicky, someone asked about, well, you know, this work is, is part of American history. For Amos, are you, do you have the same level of um, awareness or does the gravity hit you like, wait, in about x amount of years like this sound is going to pretty much represent a culture and i'm photographing the travis scotts and the futures and it, do you bring any of that to your work and and then second part vicky is you know you've done a really good job of kind of creating somewhat of an archive and 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 um a collection of this this part of american history amos is as you were working more in the digital space i would imagine and uh, before we even started, you talked about, you know, kind of consolidating your work right now. You, this downtime has, has allowed you to kind of examine your work. What are you doing to kind of preserve the work that you're making that you may not share right away, right? But will likely have that significance later, in, later down the road. That's a big question, but yeah. that's probably going to be the last question that we ask before we close out. Um, before I answer, I just want to say, um that uh, shout out to Vicky for doing the contact high to also not only just highlight the artists that are making the music, but also the artists that are taking the photos for everybody to see that, you know, like if it wasn't for also us, then nobody would be able to see the process and stuff. So that's very important. But um, as you asked the question, about me and I at first I did not know the importance of the work and the future I was just doing it because in the moment I would take the photo I would feel when I got a good photo I would get like a rush you know what I'm saying but then after like I started posting the, sharing the work and seeing it being on like multiple other pages and then going maybe like a, around the web a little bit I'm like all this stuff can be important, you know, it could, it could, it's just, it's historic, not just my street photos, but also the, the music photos as well. And, um, what I'm doing right now is just trying to create like stories with a body of work with a body of images and see if I can either tell my story or just, uh, go to, like I said before, just go to my friends and, um, see if my story can be a part of what they're working on and, and, and share it and become bigger and live forever. Very cool. All I'm right. not sure if I answered the big question, but. No, you, you did. Um, you know, you, you, you absolutely did. Uh, Vicky, you know, 
we're going to we're going to kind of wrap this up now but I, I just wanted to thank you and you know thank everyone who joined and and you know the photographers who shared the stories with us and of course joe you know for you know putting together focus on the story i mean it was my dream that we could do this live in person <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Chris. I, you know, I, as someone, I've been to the live version of Focus on the Story, and it's an amazing event. So, you know, thank you, Joe um, and Kurt, for, you know, really celebrating uh, photojournalism and photographers and just recognizing that, you know, music documentation is a part of that, you know, just as much as people who cover, um, you know, wars and life and politics um that this this is part of that larger conversation so thank you guys both thank you did you have any um did you have any closing words vicky before we thank our sponsors for today's session yeah i mean just you know i know right now you know it's hard times all around so it's good just to see everyone's face um hear their voice um I just want to, you know, encourage everyone to, a lot of photographers now are, are, are actually going through their archives now that, you know, a lot of people are home and, you know, in front mm -hmm. of their archives. So it's an interesting time for photography. Um, and I want to, you know, encourage them, you know, even when things open back up to really pay attention to, you know, archiving their work and keeping their stories out there because, this is part of a continuum, right? Delphine yeah. and Brian and Danny are on a continuum, just as Amos, of documenting, you know, these moments that that tell our, our shared shared view, worldview. Um, so just recognizing that the power in the group and the power in the storytelling um, is something, you know, that I really hope is is a a, a foundation of real unity for everyone so thank you thank you thank you thank you um we're just gonna thank our sponsors you know um because we're not doing this in person uh our, you know in spite of the fact that we're not doing this in person our sponsors have been generous um in just you know allowing us the resources to do this uh fuji film let's see tamron peak design Capital Photography Center, Multiple Exposure um, Gallery, um, and and most importantly, I think the focus on the story community. Uh, when, you know, I I make photographs as well, but I was explaining to someone, you know, I can't really make a lot of photographs right now. I mean, I can, right? But I'm not. It, it's a different. It's a different way to practice and enjoy the art form, and and having discussions like this. Um, definitely helps me to still kind of remain sane as a photographer while I'm just locked inside. <laughs> um, so, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone. And um, for all of our attendees, I, <clears throat> let me ask you a really quick question. When, when you see my screen, are you seeing the slides or are you seeing the actual, um, are you seeing my Zoom chat uh, windows? We see your slides. Yeah. You're seeing my slides, excellent. Yeah. Right. And do you see my name? Diana Zuluaga, or do you yeah. see Diana? Yes. Yes. Who is Diana? Hey, what happened? <laughs> well, What's Nick happening here, well. man? <laughs> I was like, man. <laughs> my, my thought was, my thought was that someone with a corporate Zoom account let you use their login. Oh, they changed. There we go. Now. I see you oh. now. There you go. Okay. Somebody playing games, wow. man. No. <laughs> Not all the power. Well, Zuluaga shot the Wu Tang. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's hey, Joe man. in the background. Thank um, you so much for uh, letting me join last minute. I literally found out. I befriended you now. I'm going to follow some of you guys, or everyone here. Uh, thank and, you. And, uh, you. you know, thank it was last minute. So, Vicky, man, you're a pioneer. <laughs> B plus, man. You're one of my inspirations, man. And always so supportive. That guy right there, super supportive of all B the photographer. B plus gave me my first... West Coast job. Nice. Uh, you know what? He <laughs> gave me my first West Coast job too. <laughs> I mean, plus guys, mad cool. Yo, he flew me back. I'm talking about girl. You weren't even born then, man. It was like 1990. <laughs> yeah, I'm dating myself now, man. 1990. It was like a long time well, ago. <laughs> once, uh, so he's been doing it for a minute. 
to, to <laughs> follow your point, Delphine. He's been yeah. doing it for a minute. Yeah, Thank you, brother, man. Uh, he's real good. And, you know, just to give a quick plug, I think the last time I saw, you know, Danny and Delphine and B Plus and Amos in person was at the opening of the Contact High show at ICP. Mm -hmm. um, couple months ago and so hopefully once you know all this corona stuff passes that show is going to get extended so we will hopefully all be together in person again soon at the show um to be continued so first round you should, you should bring the show to dc we we'd love to have it here yeah. somehow Tell the Smithsonian. <laughs> yeah seriously hey. um Vicky, just really quickly, before I forget, what else are you working on? If, if everyone could kind of just go around the, the room really quickly and plug whatever you're working on, like what do we have to look forward to? Yeah, uh -oh. so I'm working on a new book right now. Um, uh, it's about the history of hip hop jewelry. So another photo book with multiple photographers um, talking about the significance of you know adornment um, through the photographers and just all the com complexities of what that entails. So I'm working on a new book. Um, it's going to be published by Cashin, um, which creates, you know, amazing, amazing books. Um, so excited for that. And then traveling the Contact Hyatt exhibit after New York, it's going to go to Seattle and then make its way around the world in Abu Dhabi after that, and then make its way around uh, the world, hopefully. So that's what I got. Cool. Delphine? Um, we're working on another edition of um, um Fun, a different book um, is going to come out. So we're going to start, we're actually in pre-production for that. So that's exciting. And then I'm also working on my first monograph, which is going to be the Sacred Star of Isis. And then um, also I have like a bunch of exhibits coming up that somehow I'm making work for in isolation. <laughs> So, and then, you know, and then I, te I, I also teach, so preparing for my classes for the fall and doing all of that good stuff. Where do you yeah. teach, right. At Columbia. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And my, one of my students, in one of our, um, our we, the, one of the assignments was to bring in photographers, and one of them brought you in, Brian, which is really cool. Oh. I was like, yeah! <laughs> so he did a whole presentation. I wanted to, like, screenshot it and send it to you. He did a whole presentation on your work. It was awesome. Oh, wow. Good. Yeah. I'm working on, uh, well, I was supposed to be in Ireland developing a feature, but obviously that's not happening. So I switched my focus and I'm doing a film version of Ghost Notes because a lot of the stuff, a lot of the archival stuff is just still, there's a lot of moving stuff too. So I'm revisiting a bunch of that stuff. Just wanted to say you spoke about Fela, Tony Allen, who was a very close friend and wow, such an important figure passed away yesterday. Uh -huh. And well, there'll definitely be some Tony Allen in Ghost Notes. So, but yeah, that's what I'm working on. So. And Ghost Notes. And I teach at UPSD also. I, don't, I, don't, I teach at University of California, San Diego. So right. we're on the remote teaching mm -hmm. yeah shout out to ghost notes go get it it's an awesome book yes it's in the chat it's, it's in, in the, the chat. chat we dropped the link link to oh. it in the chat how about you amos um well since during this quarantine thing you know how like we can't be physically out shooting anything i've just been producing like a mini docuseries for a couple artists and editing like music videos from like archive ar archive footage and just uh, try to still give the artists content during this time. And then just planning for like future music videos and stuff when this is all over, supposedly May 15th. I don't even know, but <laughs> soon I got my, my fingers crossed. Shout out to that unicorn behind your shoulder. That's my daughter's. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. How about you, Danny? Oh man, uh, well right now, currently I'm teaching as well. I live in California okay. and I, I teach uh, younger kids how to film, mm -hmm. uh, how to edit, you know, focusing on digi digital storytelling, uh, which after photography, I started, you know, directing a bunch of music videos, directing my own content. I, I was offering more, um, you know, storytelling services to different companies and, and uh, you know, became more of a director. 
And uh, right now, because of contact high, I started to scan all my negatives, which I currently have like 40,000 negatives. And uh, it's a lot of work. And that's why I haven't been able to put this massive book together. And uh, little by little, I just been scanning stuff that I'm finding. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe, you know, and, and uh, it feels good, you know, and, and uh, thank you, Vicky, because you really have ignited some of that, you know, I, I, I think a lot of the photographers that we used, we were used to shooting in film, we got hit by, you know, the, the evolution of technology first, you know, then people didn't want film for the longest time. They wanted digital. And, and a lot of us that used to print, film, I used to print all my work, all the pictures that you see in the back, like everything. I used to print everything. I was part of my being a photographer, right? I would take a picture, go to the lab, print my own work. Brian knows about that. He's teaching it, right? And, um, you know, all of a sudden that, take, that gets taken out of your way, right? You can no yeah. longer print. You can no longer do this, you know, because all the art directors will be like, you're not shooting film, right? This was actually <laughs> requested. People yeah. did not want you to shoot on film anymore. You were already falling behind, right? And then all of a sudden we started shooting in film. And uh, to see Contact High coming back again, it was like, wow, man, this is... This is really what we needed. And so I've been scanning. I've been scanning, you know, good, putting pictures good. together. And, and that's, that's what I'm focusing on now. Soon. The film is coming back now in the, you know, in the commercial world, too. I mean, Amos, I hear a lot from younger photographers, like, when, you know, people shoot now, they're like, oh, can you also, like, shoot a little bit of film as well? Because people, I don't know, it's sort of a novelty or it just looks cool or just does something about it. Um, I think people are checking the feel, yeah. the feel of the photo, the not so perfect, the just like the story, the, it's not all about the photo, I guess, it's about what, it's just, I, I, I don't even know what it is, but I feel like film gives you like a more cinematic feel and it makes you slow down as a photographer and, very, and think about, you have 36 shots, 10 shots and just really try right. to get every shot you're all in. That's how we live. <laughs> like, go in there like Rambo. Like, <laughs> That's how Brian and I live, bro. You don't even understand. I'm, I'm on, you, know, <laughs> you don't even understand, bro. I, just, I so, just got this SLR, like, two weeks ago. That's the A1? That's the A1? That's the A1, yeah. That's my camera, bro. You in good? Yeah, that's a good camera, bro. Yeah, I've been going crazy. So, listen, guys, I, I really, I really, really, really got to jump in here. You and again, go. just... <laughs> just thank you all for, uh -huh. for, you know, for, for participating. Vicky, like, thank you for bringing all of us together, right? Um, and, you know, stay engaged with the Focus on the Story community because, you know, as, as we grow as an art organization and a community, it's important to have stories about things that we experience every day, not necessarily, you know, wars or border, fam you know, stories, but, you know, like, our music and our culture and the things that we engage with every day seamlessly and how photography helps to bring some of that backstory, you know, into the, the, the experience of whatever it is we're experiencing. Um, <clears throat> so thank you so much. Uh, the other, the, like the final word is I miss album covers, <laughs> but that's, that's probably like a whole nother situation, you know, like, and I think we t it's kind of like that, that technology, uh the, the the role of technology in yeah. the art form right yeah. Mm -hmm. where yeah i miss album covers so yeah. thank That's you for all the work fan on danny for it like all your album covers That's what <laughs> <he said. laughs> <Go> visit <laughs> <Danny's IG. laughs> for all his album covers thank you thank you but yeah i was um, waiting for your book danny thank you <laughs> no pressure yeah <laughs> <laughs> can i take a photo of everybody so i could yay. Yay. yay three two one Awesome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right, me here. Right. Peace. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody.